What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video. Now against the backdrop of loads of new and fairly expensive hardware, it can be easy to get carried away in the top end builds. But what if you've got around $1,500 to spend and still want to achieve great 1440p performance in a build that should be good for now and years into the future? Well in this video, I'll be showing you guys how to do just that with parts that don't make too many compromises, are easy to assemble, provide great performance and look fantastic once built. Let's do this. The Corsair Titan series is here. Corsair's latest lineup of 240mm, 280mm and 360mm of coolers feature Corsair's new flow drive cooling engine with a three-phase pump for higher flow rates, higher efficiency and better cooling. Cap swap compatibility allows you to change the top plate of your cooler while IQ Link support and Magnetic Dome RX fans round off a design that's ready to keep your CPU cool under pressure. Check out the range at the first link below. I'm going to start this video like I do in most of my PC build guides by talking about the GPU and CPU combo. And if you've not seen many GeekWatt videos before and aren't already subscribed, make sure to do so to join the club. Now, when it comes to CPUs, I've actually got two options on the table that I want to talk about today. Now, instinctively, this is a build for gaming. We're not really doing any video editing or streaming. So a Ryzen 5 chip would be okay. And I actually received in the post today, AMD's fairly new Ryzen 5 9600X. Now, this is a solid six core and 12 thread chip that delivers a decent performance uplift over the last gen Ryzen 7000 at a decent wattage, but it's a CPU that actually doesn't make sense for most people to buy. And that's because for the same price, actually slightly less, you can buy this, the last generation Ryzen 7 7700X. Now comparing these two CPUs side by side and the 7700X has two more cores and four more threads for far better multi-threaded performance, and while the clock speeds aren't quite so high, they're still pretty decent. Power consumption on the 7700X is slightly higher than the 9600X, but not by a margin that you're exactly going to notice in your month-to-month -month or year-to-year -year energy bills. So I'm afraid, Ryzen 5... <laughs> you're out the equation, the 7700X is in. Now I'm going to be pairing it up today with an RTX 4070 GPU. Now, I want to explain a little bit. A lot of my builds tend to be more AMD than Nvidia, especially at the price points, you know, the 1000, 12, 1500 and $2,000 marks. And that's because when it comes to rasterization, which is basically the easy word for straight gaming performance, no ray tracing, no DLSS, no FSR, none of that fancy nonsense, AMD tends to win out and has a bit more more power, plus you tend to get a bit more VRAM on AMD GPUs too. However, the 4070 is still a fantastic card, and while it is slightly more expensive than AMD's own RX 7800 XT, you still get 12 gigabytes of video memory and far superior DLSS and ray tracing support. Plus, when you look at the sales figures as to what you guys are actually buying, the 4070 is just a more popular GPU than the AMD counterparts, even if it offers a slight performance dip over the team red options. So if you want to maximize rasterization performance, you might want to consider the 7800 XT. But for this build, I think the 4070 is a really well-balanced option. Sticking with a bit of an MSI theme today, I'm also going to be using an MSI motherboard. And I'm really, really happy to see them bring the B650 Gaming Plus Wi-Fi to market at such an attractive price point. You guys will see in these builds, I commonly use Gigabyte's B650 Eagle board. And this is a very similar board by design. You get the AM5 socket needed to support Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 9 thousand processors. If you do happen to go the Ryzen 9600X route for this build, you may need to update the BIOS on the motherboard. But if you take a swing round to the rear IO, you see a little button up here and this is a BIOS flashback button. And what that allows you to do is update the motherboard's BIOS software without the need to install a CPU. Other features to look out for are high-speed USB 3 type A and of course your high-speed type C, standard USB 3.2 Gen 1 type A ports, as well as Wi-Fi built into the board. There are some trade-offs of this cheap board over the more expensive counterparts. You still retain, obviously, USB 3 Type A and Type C on the front panel. However, you don't get any toolless heatsink removal for the M.2s, nor do you get PCI Gen 5 for either the PCI slot or for the M.2 NVMe slot either. So as far as future-proofing goes, you aren't necessarily going to be able to run all the hardware you'd want for a top-of-the-range build, but this isn't a top-of-the-range motherboard, and I wouldn't be chucking a Ryzen 9 in here anyway, mainly due to the VRMs and power delivery, which are sufficient, 
for a slightly cheaper Ryzen 7 chip, but not exactly a 9950X or future 9950X3D. Talking of memory and storage I have selected though, RAM is provided by a 32 gigabyte 6400 megahertz kit from Team Group. This is their T-Force Delta, and it remains one of the best value DDR5 kits. You want to aim ideally for a CL30, 32 or 34 kit for DDR5. Storage, I have pushed about out a little bit more. This is MSI Spatium M480. I won't be using the more expensive heatsink derivative as it's frankly overkill for this build. Instead, I'll be opting for the far cheaper M480 without a heatsink as the built-in cooling on the motherboard not only looks a bit better, but it's gonna provide more than ample cooling support. I'm gonna begin by installing the CPU into the CPU socket, lift the arm up, open the cover and drop the chip into place, return the arm back down, followed by the memory in DIMM slots two and DIMM slots four, and then finally the NVMe drive in the very top Gen 4 NVMe slot. As I say, a bit of a shame we got no Gen 5, but it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make to pour more money from the motherboard into part like the GPU. Now, given that the 7700X is a slightly hotter running CPU than its Ryzen 5 counterpart, I have gone for an all-in-one liquid cooler. Now, you could probably opt for a smaller 240 mil unit instead to try and save a bit of cash in this build. But with lots of fairly budget $100 or so coolers on the market right now, this is MSI's Core Liquid i360, which sort of fits into that category. I actually think it makes sense to push the boat out a little bit. And it gives us again a bit more future proofing and extra fans within the build, which are just going to contribute to more airflow and lower temperatures, not only for the CPU, but for all of the parts. Now the i360 actually has a cool little trick up its sleeve on the basis that it has this universal mounting mechanism. Now within this, we have support for Intel and AMD. I also like the fact that the cooler comes with this sort of nicely organized plastic case, which has all the screws and all the different mounting bits you need in the right locations. And of course, for Intel configs, you get an included backplate. One of the advantages of AMD is that the backplate is actually pre-built into the motherboard, which is what I'll be using in the build today. For an AMD mounting config, you're going to want these, which are the posts that will install onto the motherboard, and then the corresponding thumb screws, which will fasten onto the posts and secure the cooler into place. You should have four of each. Simply go ahead and screw each of these into the threads around the CPU socket. Doesn't matter particularly what order you do them in, but just make sure when you finish them off, they're nice and tight. You want these fixings to be solid, as as I say, this is what you'll be installing the water block from the CPU cooler onto. A quick little test fit, and although the cooler's upside down, it should illustrate my point, and you can see that is how the cooler is gonna fix on. The thumb screws are gonna go over these threads a little bit later on. For now though, I'm gonna go ahead and install the motherboard into the case. Now this is another MSI component in the build today, trying to keep a little bit with the red dragon theme, and I actually used this case in another build a little while ago with, I think maybe a gigabyte or a, a rival graphics card, and I liked it so much, I've just decided to use it again. Now here in the UK, you can pick it up for around about 65 pounds over in the US should be around about $80, but I'll leave latest pricing and availability in the description below. And as far as the form factor goes, it's a pretty compact ATX case. Now it's a very no thrill chassis. There are not loads of amazing features on this case to write home about, but it does have a big tempered glass panel, three 120 mil and one 120 mil ARGB fans at the front and rear respectively, nice dust filters, a decent front tire, and perhaps most critically for a budget case, lots of mesh ventilation at the front. I really like cases like the Fractal Design Pop Air. I've used that in plenty of builds before, but the problem with that case is that it just doesn't have a great number of included fans without spending a lot more money on the RGB version. It's hard finding decent budget cases, and I think MSI have done a fairly good job with this one. To make my life a little bit easier, I am gonna lay the case down flat on the table, and that is just gonna make locating the right standoffs to use quite a bit easier. I'm gonna use my handy pop pocket camera to show you where all the standoffs are. There are three up at the top of the case, a further three along the middle and three down the bottom. If you've got a micro ATX board, you're going to be using one of these standoff locations instead while retaining the top six standoffs, which are the same for ATX and micro ATX configs. It feels slightly wrong to say it, but the IO shield does not come pre-installed as standard. So what you need to do is actually click this in instead, manually it yourself, as that's going to show you where all the ports on the motherboard go and just closes up the back of the case really. It's pure aesthetic but definitely good to get it in. Then it's a simple case of sliding the motherboard in, just get it all nicely lined up. I was going to say no raised standoffs but the one at the top and middle is, that will hold the board into place and make screwing the whole thing in quite a bit easier. All the screws and stuff you'll need come included in an accessory bag at the rear of the case. Nine in total, three at the top, three along the middle and three down the bottom. Once the motherboard's in, I'm then going to remove the top dust filter on the case and go ahead and start prepping the radiator. Now again another reason I went for this case is because of the rad support. I don't think I've got enough room to put it at the front as it's just going to get in the way of the G4 
GPU clearance. But if you take a look at the top, I believe it should fit. Yes, look at that. I have to say, I really like this cable cover that MSI have added on as well. It just makes rooting the cables and hiding the sides of the fans really easy. And it's a good budget solution to a problem that lots of higher end, far more expensive coolers have been trying to solve. So I like that. Gonna get that screwed in at the top with a few screws just to secure it down. It's a fairly cost effective solution to a problem that lots of higher end coolers have been solving at a much bigger price point. Once the radiator's in, I'm then gonna go ahead and pop the water block on. Again, just good to do a test fit, make sure we're happy with it. Yeah, that'll fit. Slightly odd with the tubes. We can definitely have a bit of a play around with those. And of course, I need to add some actual thermal paste on when I screw it in for real. So thermal paste, and then of course the thumb screws. Start with your thumbs and then finish with a screwdriver just to torque them nice and tight. Now this video isn't intended to be a full cables and wiring guide. You can find one of those linked in the card section now, but I'm gonna go ahead at this stage and just pop in all the front panel cables so that they're done before popping in the GPU. Now there's nothing worse than a GPU not fitting or filling a case, I should say, but I think this 4070 Gaming X Trio should do the business. Arguably a little overkill for this build in terms of the cooler. You could go for a cheaper MSI two fan Ventus design, something from Asus like the dual card. Either way, something a little bit more basic and the chip would be fine. However, I like to push things to the max and I wanna see how is this gonna look? Oh yeah, pretty damn good. This case, one of the only things I don't like about it is it uses the single use snap out PCI lanes. And because I've built it before, you can check that video out in the cards now, they're, well, already out. Now that makes the GPU installation easier, but if you're gonna sell the case or wanna change your board and things move around a bit, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. So MSI in future, these should definitely be the screw in rather than the single use types. Couple of screws to secure that in place and stop this from happening. And then all that remains is the power supply. Now this is Thermaltake Smart BM3750. It's 80 plus bronze, and it's one of the cheapest ATX3 units on the market that I've used and seem to trust based on my experiences with it over the last six months or so. It's got the native Gen 5 power cable for the GPU, which makes a massive difference to how clean and tidy the build looks, as well as all the other connectors we might need and plenty of wattage. Once the power supply is installed though, the build is pretty much ready to go. And it's time to see just how well this system does or does not perform. I'm hoping it's gonna perform well. Let's find out. through into performance and it's time to see how this build stacks up with its RTX 4070 and Ryzen 7 7700X. Now in Cyberpunk 2077 at 1440p high settings with DLSS frame generation enabled and ray tracing set to medium, the build pulled in a really, really impressive 73 frames per second on average. This is where the advantage of an Nvidia card really starts to show and I was very, very impressed with this result. Alan Wake 2 at 1440p high setting is next. Again, DLSS enabled, set to quality, frame gen turned on and ray tracing set to high. And here again, we saw great results at 1440p with over 90 frames per second on average. Move through into Hogwarts Legacy at 1440p high settings. And here the build again did well, pulling in an impressive 96 frames per second on average. This is a build that just keeps on getting better and better. Blackmyth Wukong was a similarly positive story with another AAA title ticked off the list. 1440p high settings, DLSS on and frame gen enabled, pulled in well over 100 FPS on average, with 120 frames to be precise. Again here, the advantage of frame generation is really showing its hand. And while it may not be a good thing in competitive SPS titles, it does work wonders in these AAA games which are more based around storytelling and open worlds. Star Wars Outlaws did well too, 1440p high with similar settings to the above, DLSS and frame gen both on and set to the quality preset, and the build pulled in 140 frames per second this time. And if that wasn't good enough for you, Call of Duty's Warzone pushes things even higher at 1440p high with DLSS set to quality and frame gen once again enabled, this time pulling in 172 frames per second on average. But James, what about those competitive esports titles? Well, let's start with Apex 1440p high. Here the build achieved well over 200 frames per second with 208 on average, while Fortnite at 1080p competitive rounds off a great set of results. Over 300 frames per second in this real esports title where top frame rates are important. That's with everything tuned down 
down to low, except the render distance, which was of course set to far. If you enjoyed this build, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.